Our next segment will be the hospitality, tourism, and leisure industry, which will be shared by Mr. Alfred Lee. Alfie? So, uh, good morning, everyone, and it's wonderful to see you in our offices today. Uh, absolutely delight to uh, meet some of you, and I hope you're finding the presentations uh, informative at this stage. Uh, we will be available for some discussions later, so please uh, feel free to come and grab us so we can go into depth with you uh, with some of the slides that we're discussing. Uh, today, I've got the pleasure of uh, presenting to you our quarterly presentation on hotel tourism and the leisure se sector. Uh, we will take a quick snapshot, look at the uh, performance of the industry as a country. Um, we'll have a quick chat about uh, where uh, development in the hotel sector is moving towards and also the state of the hotel business itself. Building on the theme uh, of grace under pressure, um, certainly, you know, I, I've got to say that it has been a fairly graceful exit of pa from pandemic uh, in that the recovery has been strong, okay, uh, but we're not quite there yet. We're still in that recovery phase, and here at LPC, we believe that we will reach the 2019 numbers towards the end of next year, okay? So that's when we will start to see all the numbers normalize uh, against 2019 metrics. We will go through some of those metrics in a second. And in terms of pressure, of course, all industries are facing some sort of challenge uh, and or challenges, and that is no doubt the same for the tourism industry. So. Uh, I'm pleased to present to you those details. The first one we're looking at is that, uh, as announced by the DOT, there were 1.6 million arrivals, foreign arrivals, in the first quarter of this year. Now, that number is the best quarterly performance we've had in the Philippines since the start of the pandemic. So I think as we mentioned before, that's a very graceful rebound coming out of the pandemic, uh, and it's very good to see that there is strong demand for people traveling to the Philippines. Now, to temper that a little bit, okay, the DOT did set a number of 7.7 .7 million arrivals, and this 1.6 million arrivals, seasonally adjusted, is probably behind the pace to hit that 7.7 7, 7 .7 number. Okay, now I say that, but we need to keep in mind that foreign arrivals is more of a marathon than a sprint. Okay, so it's just the first quarter, and we have three quarters left in which the country is able to perhaps catch up, improve its arrivals, and achieve the 7.7 .7 million target from, set by the DOT. Now, what is driving the growth and also where is the pressure or the shortfall in arrivals? Well, the biggest driver of our growth are our friends from South Korea, who over uh, many years now continue to be either the first or the second top source market to the Philippines, okay? Uh, as you will notice in uh, various news outlets, you'll see that there are constantly new flights connecting various destinations from South Korea to various destinations in the Philippines. And now we have direct flights from South Korea into five international de destinations here in the Philippines and coming from three destinations into Korea. And so that kind of linkage between the two countries bodes very well for an increase, a continued increase and sustaining uh, additional numbers of tourists from South Korea. As you can see there, they grow uh, by 26% year on year, uh, but these are big numbers. So we're nearly at 450,000 compared to 360,000 last year. Where a majority of our shortfall is coming from at the moment is no doubt everyone knows China. That's been in the news a lot and we've spoken about it for, uh, for several quarters now as well. Of course, with China, there are several pressures that they're facing domestically at the moment in their own market, okay? Uh, namely, you know, it's harder to, to get uh, passports renewed and permission to travel. Um, the flow of capital is slightly more restricted at this stage. Uh, and also, let's not forget that there has been some changing of Chinese domestic 
traveler preference, uh, preferences, okay? Uh, as a country just like Japan, China in particular, their local citizens have pivoted to more towards domestic travel uh, coming out of pandemic. And that has meant that less numbers are traveling overseas. Uh, the third thing that's putting pressure on our source markets and numbers at the moment is that whilst the Philippine peso is holding quite well and quite steady, okay, there are other currencies around the Asian region which, are at, uh, which have faced uh, sustained um, drops okay, in value, in particular Japan and Vietnam. Okay? And as a result of that, those countries being now somewhat cheaper to, uh, to travel to, have sustained excellent uh, tourism numbers across the last 12 months and even beyond that. So, <clears throat> despite uh, the macroeconomic effects of uh, currency differentiations, um, of course, the political tensions between our country and China, uh, there has still been a 150% increase. So, that's, I think that just tells us that, you know, the Chinese citizen still wants to come to the Philippines. There is um, a demand there, and we just need to be able to see that growth. Now, in terms of ADR and occupancy, ADR being average daily rate, that's the typical rate that a particular hotel will be charging its guests on any given night, okay? And occupancy being... Uh, the, the number, the percentage of rooms which are sold and occupied on, on any given night as well. This gives us a really strong picture about where our hotels are at in terms of performance and what are they trying to do at the moment, okay? So where are hotels at right now? Well, as you can see here in 2023, and this is for the whole year 2023, okay? They were still roughly 8 and 13 or 10 percent behind where they were in 2019. Of course, 2023 was one of, is one of the earlier recovery years, so we're still just ramping back. Okay? What's important to note, though, is that ADR has super, su surpassed occupancy. Okay? Now, what does that actually mean or what does that entail? And why are hotels pushing their room rates up as opposed to pushing their occupancy up, okay? The reason why hotels are driving their average daily rate is not because of external factors, but rather internal cost control and expenses, okay? The inflationary pressures that you and I all experience on a day-to-day -day level also affects the hotel very much as well, okay? They also have to clean their rooms. They also need to buy cleaning products purchase food and beverages and other services. So their cost base has gone up, okay? And so they can't afford just to drive occupancy because their margins will start to, um, start to decline. They actually have to drive the room rate up as well to ensure they can maintain the same level of profitability in their hotels. So that's where hotels are at uh, at this stage. I'm going to talk a little bit more about ADR and occupancy a little bit later uh, when we get to the slide about uh, future development. Right now, uh, I'd like to give you a picture and break down, just at, a, at, the, at the next stage, uh, hotels by sector, okay? Now, this is related to Metro Manila specifically, all right? What you can see is that the top graph here is occupancy across various hotel segments in our industry, okay? It's a little bit of a mixed bag, to be honest, right? Um, so it's there or thereabouts, and I would say that we're still behind 2019, but we're for sure very much catching up to those numbers in terms of occupancy, and that's excellent to see. These occupancy numbers will continue to increase uh, as I mentioned, and as I said before, you know, we expect that these, uh, the occupancy numbers will cross 2019 somewhere next year, okay? In terms of room rates, you know, looking at 
the lower end of a scale in terms of economy, mid-scale, and even the upper mid-scale, it's flat, but they've certainly caught up to the 2019 levels or the pre-pandemic levels, okay? Uh, what's interesting, though, is that in this upper upscale and luxury segment, the room rates have really started to push out, and in particular, luxury hotels, okay? Now, why is that? Well, if we go back to the discussion uh, just a minute ago regarding cost base, okay? For an economy hotel, the consumption or the, the expense side of their profit and loss is really around the operations of the building and the labor costs, right? Whereas in a luxury hotel, there, there is a much more diverse spread of cost components, okay? Um, so in economy, ho economy hotels, you don't really have a food and beverage offering, whereas in, in some luxury hotels here in Metro Manila, they've got eight, nine, ten restaurants that are operating, and that cost base has really skyrocketed, just like your supermarket bills have as well. So there is a little bit of rate protection here, okay? I'm uh, sorry, uh, margin protection going on. Uh, by the hotels, and I would say that on the flip side, from the demand perspective of the luxury traveller, as Roy had mentioned before, uh, luxury properties have been doing quite well, and we're talking about a segment that is somewhat immune to, you know, the, the cost of living uh, type expenses, okay, uh, and so they continue to frequent luxury and upper upscale hotels. Uh, and pay the rates that are being demanded of them. And so for my final slide, this is the hotel supply uh, for the past few years and moving into the future for uh, 2017 to 2028. And when I look at these numbers here and these graphs, I think there's four sort of stories to tell, all right? There's four segments here that I'd like to explain to you First of all, let's go back to this pre-pandemic era, 2017 to 2019. You'll see that both the arrivals figures, which are in blue, and the red figures, which is the additional room key supply added to the hotel industry, were both moving in lockstep together, okay? So as uh, arrivals are increasing, uh, uh, our supply of hotel rooms are also increasing. Now, of course, the pandemic hits, all projects are shut down, right? And there is no construction, there's basically no movement in the industry for several months, if not a couple of years. Okay, now what happens then? Well, from a development standpoint, what happens is what well, you can't build, okay? No one can come to work. So some projects, the earlier projects, so where they're only 10 or 20% into the development phase, the planning phase of the hotels, well, they could stop and do a U-turn and no longer proceed. But there is a sub-segment sub of hotels that did need to, that were quite advanced already, and uh, had to take a pause and continue to uh, finish their development at a later stage. Now, of course, the arrivals just fell through the, the floor, okay? Um, and we locked down as a country. Right, af right after the pandemic, the third phase I wanted to talk to you about is sort of the, post the immediate post-pandemic phase, right? Which I would say we're at the tail end of at the moment. I define that as approximately the first two years, let's say, after the lockdown has ended. And we're getting to the tail of that. Now, what happens in that first two years after the pandemic has, uh, has ended? Well, if I started my hotel project in 2017, 2018, but then I had to shut down, right? I'm now gearing to open up my hotel, okay? So the immediate bump was that yes, there was some development that was in the pipeline that couldn't open, that was able to, um, was able to pre-open their hotels. At the same time, a large part of this increase, this short-term increase that we've seen, has come from the integrated resorts and casino sector, okay? That sector works off a slightly different set of 
business metrics, okay, uh, which includes very much, you know, sort of uh, what is the regulatory environment and political situation at the time, okay. So, what we saw here was that the casino and IR sector, several big announce, uh, several big openings, and we're going to see a few of them come this year. There was uh, the Weedas uh, Hotel, the Swiss Hotel, sorry, in Clark, attached to the Weedas. Uh, of course, the Robinsons property in Cebu, and two very large openings here, Soleil North and uh, the Mega World project of uh, Westside in Manila Bay. And we're talking about three to 4,000 keys alone between those four properties. So that's what this bump is, okay? Now, as international rivals have started to increase, the government set a target of 12 million in 2028. Okay, and we use that as sort of a guiding light at this stage. You can see in the dotted line that, you know, if we were to move from 7.7 .7 million this year to 12 million in 2028, we, we need to sustain average increases every year of international arrivals at about 11, 10, 9 percent. Let's call it 10 percent, okay, year on year for the next four years. Now, if we achieve that, we have a slight problem because hotel supply has slowed down, okay? Our pipeline that we currently collect data for is suggesting to us that following this year, we're going to see less than 1% growth in hotel keys between 2025 and 2028, okay? That is a significant factor because it may in fact limit our ability as a country to reach the 12 million uh, arrivals number. And that would be a real pity. So we're encouraging significant more development, okay? As a result of this, uh, one key message that I wanted to leave with you today is that room rates and occupancy will undoubtedly, if this scenario plays out, and it looks like it is at this stage, start increasing. And so towards the end of next year, 2025, 2026, you may see that occupancy start rising and very, very quickly behind that, room rates or ADR will climb it as, as well. And it will become a more expensive um, pastime for us to travel uh, locally and for foreigners to come here. So uh, if you're gonna travel in the next five years, do it in the next 18 months help the tourism industry out. That's all I've got for you today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Alfie. Just to give a few moments to collect our notes. For the hospitality sector, Q1 so far posted also the best performance since the pandemic. That's an 18% increase from the previous quarter. The up figure is 1.66 million international tourist arrivals, and 43% of that is led by South Korea and US. We are also seeing average daily rates, or ADRs, going up to maintain profit levels and also due to inflationary pressures. For the um, segments, upscale and luxury brands have surpassed pre-pandemic levels in terms of occupancy rates and also ADRs. For the outlook, we see a potential shortage in hotel supply, thus helping occupancy rates improve and most likely shortly after that, the average daily room rates as well.